reading seven verses, commencing at the first verse. Tell somebody, stay in that vein. I just heard the Lord say that, stay in that vein. And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engadi. And Saul took 300 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep goats by the way where was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet or to go to sleep. And David and his men remained in the sides of that cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thy hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose, listen, and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe, Privately or privately? Privately. And it came to pass afterward, David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing among my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with his, these words. And suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. Amen. Re remain standing. We're going to pray. But the message I'm going to preach this morning is how to respond to your enemies. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Clap your hands for the word of the Lord. The grass withered, the flower faded away. But the word of our God shall stand forever. How to respond to your haters. There is a proper way to handle haters. Have I got a witness here? Let's get honest this morning. If you're not too ashamed to testify, all of us have experienced enemies, haters, persons that dislike us because God appreciates us. I often share, and even as I'm going to share this morning, that when you are the anointed of God, get ready for attack. When God has his hand upon your life, be sure that assault is right around the corner. The enemy is very, very crafty, and slick, slimy, cunning, patient, and baffling. And the enemy, um, the devil, Satan, the accuser of the brothers, not attacking you over where you are right now, but he's attacking you because he has a sneaky suspicion what God is about to do round the corner. So he wants to kill your motivation. He wants to aggravate you and frustrate you before you even lay eyes on your promised destiny. So you have to always be ready and prepared and armed to fight the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But scripture says, but against principalities, against powers of this world, against rulers of the darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, put on, I thought I had a Bible reader, the whole armor of God 
that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And having done all to stand, Paul says stand anyhow. When you get to the place where you are at a standstill, when you have exhausted everything you have to fight, be assured that God is right there by your side. I wish I had some noise in here. Last week, Jody, we dealt with David in his cave experience. God had been systematically removing every single support, Tanya, from David's life. First lady, God isolated David and snatched his support system. But yet, in his dark place, God used him to train men to be mighty. It's in your dark place in life when God send you real supporters. I call them legacy supporters. Anybody can come support you and embed you and staff you when you're riding high. But it's those that will come and gird you up and get up under you and come alongside of you when you're going through more hell than Carter got liver pills. Have I got a witness here? So you thank God for those that come in your dark and you're deterred and you're dismal and you're depressed and you're disappointing times because those are the ones that will help you sustain the legacy long. Watch this after you have lived. So you ought to thank God for those dark times because God will show you in the dark times who your real friends are. Hallelujah. Dark times has a way to show you who your real friends are, show you who you really are, and then show you who God really is. And I got a witness here. And so I'm thankful even on this morning that God had been teaching David the difficult lesson that only God is worthy to be leaned on. Amen. So today we find David still <laughs> living in this cave. So while David is in the cave, he is presented with an opportunity to cast or to exact revenge upon his greatest enemy. While David and his men hide in that cave, the providence of God brings King Saul into the same cave and at the same time. Let me give you a backdrop because many of you were not here last week and I have to give you a backdrop so you can understand where I'm going. Israel wanted a king just like all the other nations and they sought out God and God gave them King Saul. And the Bible says that King Saul, long short, was disobedient to God and God rejected him. Meanwhile, Samuel had anointed David to be the next king. And while the rejection was going on, in the camp where David was assisting Saul, Saul began to get favored by the people. And long short, King Saul became jealous. How many know that jealousy is cruel as the grave? Yeah. Uh, became jealous and um, intimidated by David. So long short, King Saul put a hit list on David to have him killed. I come to tell you again, if you can't shout over this, you missed the whole point. When you're anointed, people will try to kill you. Yeah. Kill your dream, kill your, your destiny, kill your happiness. and um, Yeah, they, they will put you in situations where you feel like you did them wrong. Come on, say amen. So the Bible is very clear about... Um, 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 King Saul wanting to kill David. So here David now is in the cave. And King Saul now finds out that he's in this particular situation and comes seek out David. David now has a perfect opportunity. Here's King Saul in the same cave. And he doesn't know that his men and David are there hiding. And now he has a perfect opportunity to kill Saul and claim the throne and even elevate himself all the way to the top. But David doesn't do what most people would have done in that situation. Instead of reacting with hatred and revenge and murder, David displays love, grace, compassion, watch this, and forgiveness. 
That would be a good place to shout. So it's easy, um, Kia, to see in the text, Crystal, uh, why the Lord called David, it's on the screen, a man after God's own heart. Considering the verses of this chapter this morning, I didn't want to read the whole 22 verses, but we'll go through it. We often find ourselves in the same place in which David found himself. Someone will do us wrong. Have I got a witness here? I said someone will do us wrong or do something against us and we will be offended and hurt by their actions. Y'all not talking, but I'm preaching. And then somewhere down the line, Jamal, or down the road, the opportunity will present itself for us to get even. And we will have to um, get to the place where we know that God has revenge, but we will have a chance to get back. But what we do, listen, at that very moment, defines who we really are. What we do when that opportunity for revenge presents itself reveal the true nature of our heart. Like it or not, beloved, we all have encountered with others things that did not go well. I said we all have encountered stuff with other people that didn't turn out too good. And we all find ourselves hurt at times and when we hurt, here we go. We want the one who hurt us to feel pain as well. I can't hear nobody. But I believe that David's life offers us some insight this morning into what to do when we've been hurt by other people. So I want you to look at these verses this morning and preach for a few minutes on the thought how to respond to your enemies. There is a proper response to your haters. Let me say that one more time. There is a proper response to your haters. First of all, we want to see in the text, it's on the screen, the injuries of David's life. Got to work with that for a moment. Walk with me around this text. 1 Samuel 24, verses 1 to 2, King James Version. And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told to him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of what, Tanya? Ingedi. 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 <laughs> then Saul took Baldi, 3,000 chosen men out of Israel, and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild oaks. And the people of God said to him, Amen. Listen, the first thing I want you to understand is that David was a hated man. Say that, hated man. Amen. Saul hated David. He hated David because David was everything that Saul himself was not. I'm talking about David's injuries now. He hated David because he walked with the Lord. He hated him because God was blessing David. The blessing of David is, 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 is so rich that Saul hates him. Let me pause parenthetically to push into this period from the passage from the pulpit that watch this, the blessings of the Lord are scandalous. In other words, the, the, the blessings you have make people don't like you. I mean, you, you can't help it. I mean, and can I help you? Uh, uh, look at your name and say, don't even apologize about being blessed. I mean, I mean, come on, y'all. You woke up blessed. You, you, you got on the shirt right now. You're blessed. Come on, touch somebody real good. Tell them I'm too blessed to be stressed. <laughs> yeah, David was hated because uh, he was accepted and, and Saul was rejected. He hated David and he was determined, listen, to see David put to death. Look at the chapter before the chapter that we read. Chapter 23 of 1 Samuel, verse 14. I'll read it in the New Living Translation. It reads like this. Now David stayed in the strongholds of the wilderness and in the hill country of Ziph. Saul hunted him day by day. Here's your place to shout. But God didn't let Saul find him. I mean, really, I could preach right there. 
And if I preach right there, I'm going to go off my subject. I really can use that right there and go crazy. Can you lead with somebody real good with authority and tell them, aren't you glad God healed you? I, I, I'm, I'm about to creep over here for a minute. Uh, uh, you deserve to die and God still hears you. Uh, uh, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom should I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, just before they got to me, they stumbled and they fell. Though a host should encamp against me, one thing that I desire of the Lord, that would I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in this temple. For in the time of trouble, here we go, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle, shall he hide me? You listen, God will hide me and still present me the same time. He prepared a table in the presence of my enemies. Watch this, he's hiding me in their presence. Say, neighbor, you've been hid in the presence of your hater, but you gotta learn how to respond. <laughs> God Almighty. God Almighty. He's hiding you right in front of their face. But you gotta learn how. Now I'm getting too ahead of myself. Feed those jokers. Your haters promote you for free. Save your money for advertising. They'll tell what you're doing for free. Whether it be good or not. Let me help you. Good news and bad news still news. And people inquire news. But I came all the way from Akakit, Maryland to preach the good news to you today. There's nothing that devil or the enemy can do to you. Because you are hidden. He hides you. You ought to shout 10 seconds right now that God didn't let your enemy find you. Come on, you ought to shout about 10 seconds right now <laughs> that God didn't let your enemy find you. Come on, I'm not, I'm not talking about when the world, I'm talking about right now. There's some stuff you did in the world. You should be dead, but God hid you. Y'all quiet here. There's some folk want to kill you while you're in the kingdom. In their mind, they say stuff like this. I wish they were dead. Smile in your face, but can't stay in your guts. And you know what gets me? Listen, folk want to support you as long as you don't go far as them. They will push you, but not farther as them. <laughs> Saul was consumed by jealousy and hatred. It was literally eating him alive. Now listen, I want you to get this. David was hated not for evil in his life, but because his life was pleasing to the Lord. Get this now. Let me say this. Make sure that when you are hated, you are hated for doing right and not for doing wrong. You have to see this because the Bible is very clear about your, your place in God. If people find fault with you, with you, let it not be because you are stubborn and hateful and mean and nasty. But rather let it be because we're holy, decent, and good. Preacher. I mean, man, I, I, I got to say it. 
I, I got the lead here for a moment. I'm going to pull over, but I'm going to keep the, mo the motor running. Man, people can be nasty in church. People can be mean and ornery and arrogant in church. Don't, 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 don't think because you come into church, new people, that, that everybody's a saint. And, and everybody, this is a leap club for good people. And everybody in here perfect. Can I come to tell you? If you think the church is perfect, it became unperfect when you walked through the door. Y'all not saying nothing. Because everybody and their mama got some struggle, got some sin, got some trespasses, got some transgression, got some iniquity in their life that need God to remove from them. But it's a one day at a time move. So you got to be patient with mean folk. Patient with nasty folk. Patient with folk that got slander and gossip and backbiting. Y'all not saying nothing. You got to be patient with folk that's going through. Because you got to remember you did too. Don't forget now. Don't forget where you were. Don't forget how you used to be. Don't forget how where you come from. Y'all quiet here. Because at the very moment you forget where you came from, you're destined to return. You ought to be lifting up your hands and say, God, keep me. And, and make sure I don't forget where I came from. Because if I forget, oh my God, I come to tell you, I mess up everything and everybody. Lean on somebody, tell them, don't forget where you come from. Lean on your other person, say, you ain't arrived yet. Look behind you, tell them, just when you thought you got it, you just lost it. You got to remain faithful and humble. God will exalt you in due season. Have I got a witness here? So not only was David a hated man, watch this, David was, the text says, he's a hunted man. David was hated and he was hunted. When Saul heard where David was hiding, Saul sought to find David and kill him. If we get honest this morning, we can testify there are some times when we feel like we're being hunted by those who dislike us. Y'all not saying nothing, but I'm preaching myself happy. But I come to tell about 15 of y'all, I'd be 16. When you are, watch this, anointed, you will be hated and hunted. Yeah, I said when God's hand is on your life, you will be hated and hunted. Um, be careful what you ask for. Um, folk want the anointing without the hunt. Y'all said, folk want the anointing, but the anointing costs you hate. Uh, the anointing costs you being hunted down. Therefore, you become the largest target that you ever was. I come to tell you, when you are anointed, you will be targeted for hate and hunt. It seems to me that our enemies always looks to destroy us and defeat us. So we see first the injuries of David's life. <laughs> then we see the illusions of David's life. Now the, the word illusions means that thing um, that seems wrongly perceived or uh, our interpreted senses. That thing that's wrongly perceived. It's right in the text. 1 Samuel 24, 3, 4, New Living. At the place where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself or to relax or to go to sleep, to chill. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. Picture that. Now's your opportunity. David's men whispered to him. Today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. And the people of God says, let me, let me deal with this illusion. For some of you, uh, uh, you got to understand it. This word, it, it means uh, uh, the thing that is wrongly perceived. Now watch this. Picture this. Put yourself in David's shoes. Walk with David. Yeah. He's hunted and hounded. Watch this. 
without a cause. Let me run that again. He's hated. He's hounded. He's hunted. There it is. For no reason at all. <laughs> a person you have done nothing against is after you. They're doing everything in their power to destroy your name and take your life. Walk in the shoes. Then, watch this Mama Rose, you are presented with an opportunity to get back at them. <laughs> are you walking? Uh, you are giving body, Lisa, Pat, Dwayne, you're giving, what's this, the perfect chance to right all of your wrongs. And all you have to do is take the opportunity and your enemy falls and you win. Are you walking with them? What do you do when that opportunity presents itself? Now, if you're living with illusions, about what's right and what's wrong, you'll get your revenge. However, if you see things through the eyes of God, you might do something entirely different. Let, let, let me unpack it. <laughs> the first illusion, it's on the screen, is the illusion of reputation. Say that, illusion. A reputation. When Saul wandered or wandered into the cave where David and his men were hiding and Saul laid down to go to sleep, David was presented with what appeared to be a golden opportunity. Here was his chance to get even. Here was the opportunity to get back and even the score. And the Bible says all of David's men even challenged him to take his sword and kill Saul. All right. All right. To these men, David was a hero. Watch this. Illusion of reputation. And if he had failed to kill his enemy when he was given an opportunity, would he not be like a coward in their eyes? Here I come. So there was this subtle temptation to get even to protect his reputation. <laughs> the illusion of reputation. Liberty House, how many times, Tracy, how many times <laughs> have we retaliated against someone who hurt us in an effort to protect our reputation. I've discovered that many don't want others to think that we're weak. Y'all not talking to me. I'm on my way. We want the respect of those around us so we lash out. When we have the chance thinking it makes us look big to those around us. My brothers and sisters, I don't want to hurt you this morning, but when we think that way, we are living an illusion. Yep. We never look more childish and more petty than when we take our revenge just to save face before other folk who really don't care anyway. Man, I'm teaching so good this morning. So there is the illusion of reputation in the text, and then there is the illusion, let me go, of revenge. The illusion of reputation, then the illusion of revenge. Now David, watch, he watched Saul, listen, into that cave and go to sleep. Watch this illusion of revenge. Surely the flesh said, now's the chance. Take your dagger and end this persecution. Kill him and be free. Kill him and be king. So David, he, he, the Bible says he crept. 
he slips over uh, uh, where, where he was creeping. <laughs> where, where Saul is sleeping with a knife in his hand, having the opportunity to end it all. Now, probably no one would have cared or would have blamed him for killing Saul. In fact, those 400 men would have applauded him for doing it. Because remember, they were from Israel under Saul's tyranny and taxation. They was broke, remember? They was in debt, discontented, and depressed. But my question is, what do you do? Now put yourself in David's place. You've been wronged by someone have hurt you deeply then you are given the perfect opportunity to get even do you take the chance and destroy your enemy do you take the opportunity to get even what do you do the flesh says get him they deserve it get back at them hurt them worse than they hurt you and when that moment comes and it will. What do you do? Depends on who you're listening to. The flesh and the world are like David's men. Y'all remember? David's men say, man, go get that choker. The opportunity to revenge is at hand. Yeah. They cried out for revenge. However, God has a different view of this man. Listen to what the Lord says. It's in Romans 12, 19, 21. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For if he so doeth, thou shalt reap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. How to respond to your enemies. You see, the idea of revenge is merely an illusion. Get this. Why? Because you can never get even with anyone. It's impossible to balance the scales of hurt. Y'all not saying nothing here. The only possible way to come out on top is to learn to respond to hurt with a godly attitude. So in the rest of this passage, David shows us to respond correctly to those who injure us. It's here where we see the integrity. It's on the screen. Of David's life. We saw the injuries hunted and hated. We saw the illusions of revenge. What's the other one? But now we see the integrity of David. First of all, we see the integrity of his character. It's right in the text. 1 Samuel 24, 5-7, King James Version. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him. He knew it was wrong because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing <clears throat> unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, saying, He is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his service with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went his way. And the people of God says amen. amen. You got to see this. It's, it's, it's incredible. Um, the Bible is very clear. When David had the chance to kill Saul, he refused to do it. Let's look at the integrity of his character. Instead, David cut off a small piece of Saul's robe. They let him know I could kill you. Yeah. Let me just stop right here. That was still wrong. Yeah. 
that you know I still could have got you. I just, I just want you to know. I mean, I want you to know that, you know, I could have put you in that, that trunk. I want you to know that. And as soon as he did it, he knew it was wrong. You see, even though David could not respect Saul the man, here we go, he still respected the office of Saul the king. And let me just park right here. You may not respect me as, as a man, but respect my office. You may not understand everything I do as a man, but respect me as the office of your pastor. In other words, don't you cut nothing off of me. Woo. Uh, I just added that in. Just, just uh, let, let me, I'm walking. Never hurt anything that God had helped. I don't care what you think of them. If God has helped them, you better not hurt them. Touch not. Talk back to me, somebody. I don't care how you feel. I don't care what they did. It's not your job. Your job, watch this, is to pray to God and vengeance belongs to the Lord. I receive He tells his men about this and stops them <laughs> from harming Saul as well. Y'all have wrote that down. Never hurt what God harmed. Yeah. So David immediately knew that his thoughts of revenge and his desire to get even were not from the Lord. The people of God says amen. Amen. Uh, He knew that he didn't have the right to play judge and jury in the life of Saul. I could talk about a lot of that. So we see the integrity of his character. Then secondly, we see B, the integrity of his confrontation. First Samuel 24, 8 to 15, New International Version. Then we're going to get to the rest of the scriptures. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My Lord, the king! I looked up some of them pictures, man, that they show him coming out the, coming out the, uh, the cave and some of these little Google pictures and stuff. I do a lot of researches. And it, just, it, it was awesome. Just saw the cave and him coming out there and laying on the ground and screaming, My Lord, the king! And Saul looked behind him. David bowed down, prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, Why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said I would not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. When you lay your hands on me, you lay your hands on God. See my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting, hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evil doers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. Amen. People of God says amen. amen. So when Saul leaves the cave, David follows him. And he sets the record straight. In these verses, David follows clear biblical principles that teach us how we should react when we are wronged by others. So a lot I can say about this. I don't have enough time to get into it. But we should not wait for other persons to make the first step. 
Look at Luke 17, 3, 5, the international version. It says this, so watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The pastor said to the Lord, increase our faith. In other words, man, that's hard, but we got to do what we got to do. So A, the integrity of his character, and B, integrity of his confrontation, and C, the integrity of his consolation. First Samuel chapter 24, 16 to 22, New International Version. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I. He said, yes, yes, yes. you have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king, God of mine, and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. And swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants. And David did or wipe out my name from my family or my father's family. So David gave his oath to Saul. He kept it. We'll see it. I'm going to stay in this vein for a while. And Saul returned home. But David and his men went up to the strong. People of God says amen. amen. It's critical, y'all, to see this because David's grace in this situation touched the hard heart of King Saul. God used uh, the response of David to bring about peace that day. Consequently, David got what he was after, not because he took matters into his own hands, but because he placed things in the hands of the Lord. Here's the bottom line, beloved, and I'm gone. We ain't going to shout. We ain't going to do nothing. We already shouted, and I'm out. When we live the right kind of life and practice grace and forgiveness, God would take the pains of life and transform them into avenues of peace. Yeah. I'm through now, but Abraham Lincoln, he once uh, been criticized for his attitude towards his enemies. Why do you try to make friends with them, a colleague asks. You should try to destroy them. Am I not destroying my enemies, the president asks gently, when I make them my friends? I'm not saying nothing. I tell you, there's a proper way to respond to your enemies. I wish I had voice to preach it. When you respond correctly, the Lord will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemy. And then the mature child of God, watch this, shall be able to boast in the Lord and give God praise. Can you tell somebody there is a way to respond to your enemies? Everybody's standing. There's a proper way to respond to your enemy. You overcome evil with good. Jesus says, pray for your enemies. When they falsely persecute you, bless them, for there is a crown of righteousness. On the cross, Jesus says, forgive them. Watch this. Even when they do know what they do. He says, for they know not what they do. But some people know what they do. Their hurt is intentional. Misguided. And harmful. But the way you respond. Here, here it is. I'm not accountable for what you do to me. 
I'm accountable. What I do and how I respond to you. I never gauge a Christian by how he acts. I gauge me how I react to what's been do done unto me. And when you get to that place, you don't harbor resentment. You don't secretly plan. You know, enemies can live in your head rent-free. You can lay up all night thinking about somebody who hates you, and that's not your problem. That's theirs. But when you walk in the shoes of David, when you have an opportunity to get back at them, when you have an opportunity to mess them up, when you have an opportunity to put them out there, you can kill somebody's name by not covering your enemy. You know when you grow up when you can cover your enemy. He covered the enemy. He covered David. He covered Saul in that, in that, that cave. He covered him because his, his the 400 men would have killed Saul because they ain't like him neither. But he covered, don't do it. Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't go on him. Don't, no, 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 don't, don't do it. And it brings peace. Saul walked out of that cave, softened his heart. He said, David, you're a much better king than I am. Just don't allow them to kill off my descendants. I'm not there. I wish I could give it to you. I wish I had Bible readers. There was a there was a grandson named Meshivatheth that was dropped, and he got crippled. And David was looking for him. Meshivatheth thought that David was gonna kill him. And David said, "You'll eat at my table as long as you live, because I kept a covenant with your father, Jonathan, which was Saul's son." You got to stay in this. I'm going to stay in this vein. I got to give you all. I'm going to stay in all this book and go through David's life and see why God called him a man after my own heart. Even when he slept with Bathsheba and had Bathsheba's husband killed. But God says, you're a man after my own heart. How you, what, how you going to respond to your enemies? You got to make the first step. Don't be like, well, I'm cool. I ain't going to do nothing. Well, they got to come to me. I'm just, you know. You go make the extra effort so God can work on their heart. Because you bring peace in their life. God will bring peace in your life. There's some stuff in your life where you need peace. On this side. I don't know what it is, but you do. There's some stuff over there that you need peace in. And going by that person who harms you and bring peace back in his life because Saul had peace now. He's no longer after David. He's at peace with himself. How are you going to respond? Are you going to fix it today? Can you go to that person that you know kind of was slippery and slimy and slick? You ain't got to tell them that you saw it. Don't be like, David, I cut it off. I saw you know him. You know what? I love you. I saw your hand, but I love you anyway. Then allow God to do the conviction. Father, I love you today. I hope I said something or you said something through me that would encourage somebody to do the right thing. I know it's not hard. We like the apostles. Increase our faith. It takes faith to do that. knowing that you're going to do the repaying, that you will fix it, that you will build the bridge. And God, if there's anything that I've done to hurt somebody, forgive me. And if you can't make a way, open up the door so they can come and tell me what I did so I can ask for forgiveness. I'm sorry, God, for things that I don't even know about. Give me clean hands. I need you to heal me. And I know you can't heal me unless I heal 
my relationships with others. Help me to reflect. Help me to slow down and take this more serious. My forgiving others is at the same degree that you will forgive me. And forgive us our debts as we forget our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever Amen Come on, clap your hands Remain standing Will there be one today that need Christ our leader stewardship will come that need Christ today would there be one that can open up your heart and give it to Jesus?